For nearly 40 years, East Germany's Stasi was one of the most formidable secret police forces in the world. The Stasi ended up over the years imprisoning about 200,000 people. The former communist state's sprawling network of spies and informers reached across the globe until the fall of the Berlin Wall. The greatest evil is done now by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails. Those who went against the regime were targeted, even on British soil. It must have been from here the gunman tried to shoot me. As the Cold War came to an end, scores of Stasi spies were still operating in the UK. It's hard to find a part of the world they didn't target to operate. The tentacles of East German foreign intelligence were global. It's quite remarkable how in-depth the level of surveillance was. Recently opened court files obtained by this program reveal the extent of the spy network's operations. So why, 30 years after Germany made their Stasi files public, are the identities of many alleged British informers still being kept secret? Allowing people to get away with it so it does not cause embarrassment is a very British way of doing things and is very toxic. And with Russia's President Putin himself once a card-carrying member, what does the dawn of a new Cold War tell us about the legacy of the Stasi today? Germany. I was a student here in the late 80s, before the Berlin Wall came down. Cold War Berlin was a far cry from the cosmopolitan city that it is today. Then, a deadly playground for spies, it was also home to the most notorious and terrifying arm of the East German state, the Stasi. For decades, it controlled communist East Germany with fear, paranoia and brutality. Now I've come back to talk to those who suffered at the hands of this very secret police force. My name is Siegfried Wittenburg. I was targeted by the Stasi because of taking photographs. Siegfried simply photographed everyday life in East Germany. When I show photograph, I can show reality how it is. This is a critical view of New Berlin, Quarter and Rostock, my hometown. The biggest uh, boss of the Communist Party said to me, Mr. Wittenberg, don't be so pessimistic. We well, want to build beautiful cities. I could see what is in socialism not good. There is no grass, there are no trees. It, just, it was reality. The communist authorities wanted the world to see an idealized East Germany, but Siegfried's photos documented the reality of day-to-day -day life there. There was a ferry ship. It goes four times a day to Denmark and came back, and I was standing on the beach. What, what will happen? and you can go with the ship to Denmark. Und aber in den Westen gehen, fliehen, ist auch gefährlich. After the Second World War, Germany was split in two. West Germany was allied to Europe and the US, while East Germany was firmly in the sphere of Soviet Russia. More than 12,000 people have defied East German guards in their bid for freedom. More than 50 have been shot and many more captured. To stop people from escaping to the West, in 1961, the authorities built the Berlin Wall. It became the most potent symbol of the Cold War, separating two very different ways of life. These two policemen walked before me and have had the idea, oh, take a picture of this policeman. And I take it. In this moment, this policeman turned 
and to ask it for my passport. And uh, this man told about me to the Stasi. Uh, please, uh, Stasi, uh, have a look what Mr. Wittenbrook is doing. <laughs> Siegfried was just one of many the Stasi spied on. My name is Wolfgang Welsch. For the East German state, I was public enemy number one. Wolfgang was first arrested trying to flee to the West. Later, he would become one of the most successful operators helping hundreds of East Germans escape the communist state. He was locked up here in one of its most notorious prisons, Hohenschönhausen in Berlin. Und wie waren die Leute, die hier arbeitet haben? Was für Leute waren die? Das heißt, die haben uns als Abfall, als Kakerlaken mhm. behandelt und auch so genannt. Ja. Wir waren Dreck für die. Ja. Nichts Menschliches. Nichts Menschliches. Nichts Menschliches. Ja, und so haben die die Menschlichkeit. Ja. Ausgelöscht. Ja, ausgelöscht, ja. im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes, ja. Wolfgang was beaten, kept in solitary confinement and mentally tortured. Und eines Nachts, es war schon dunkel, ich lag auf der Pritsche, schloss die Tür auf. Äh, einige Uniformierte kamen rein. Die legten mir eine Augenbinde um. Irgendwann ging eine Tür auf und ich spürte frische Luft. Also wir waren draußen. Auf einmal gab mir einer einen Stoß, rücklinks, und ich flog an eine Wand. Und dann hörte ich auch, wie jemand sagte, das oberste Gericht der DDR hat sie heute Nachmittag zum Tode verurteilt. Das Urteil wird jetzt vollstreckt. In mir kroch eine Kälte von unten nach oben. Ich war wie erstarrt. Ich dachte, nein, das kann doch nicht sein. Was habe ich gemacht? Und dann hörte ich, ich sah ja nichts, wie Gewehrschlösser knackten. Und dann kam der Befehl Feuer. Ich war aber nicht tot. Das war Platzpatronen. Eine Scheinhinrichtung. Wolfgangs captors had tried to break him. Und das war so traumatisch. Ich konnte zwei Jahrzehnte darüber nicht sprechen. Across society, the Stasi operated through terror, deploying a vast network of informants. My name is Katja Heuer. I was born in East Germany and I'm a historian. At its height, more than 250,000 people work for the Stasi as official employees or informers and spies reporting on their friends and family. With the Stasi, if you add the informal informers, basically, so ordinary people who, who gave the Stasi information, you are down to about 1 um, to 70 people. Like one block of flats effectively being surveyed by one person who gave information to the Stasi. Tell me a bit about how the informers worked and how they were recruited. The Stasi could either use threats, they could use coercion, they could bribe you, they could offer you promotions, they could take promotions away from you. So informers could be your husband, your wife, your neighbour, um, your colleague. But the Stasi's reach extended far beyond East Germany. It had one of the most sophisticated foreign spy networks in the Cold War dedicated to infiltrating Western Europe, including Britain and beyond. And they all answered to a legendary spy master, the mysterious Marcus Wolf, known as the man without a face. My name's Anne McElvoy. I studied in East Germany in the mid to late 80s. Marcus Wolf 
was really synonymous with East German foreign intelligence. He was a man of mystery for, I think, a good two decades before the first picture of him emerged. So there was a secrecy about him, but there was also, as time went by, a bit of a glamour as well that he wasn't averse to working with. Anne returned to Berlin as the Times East German correspondent. After the wall came down, she worked closely with Markus Wolf, helping him to write his memoirs. The East German Foreign Intelligence Service was seen as the jewel in the crown. It was hugely, hugely prestigious to work for the intelligence service abroad, and it recruited with that in mind. This is uns eine ganz besondere, große Freude, den sowjetischen Kundschafter, Genossen Kim Philby, begrüßen zu können. This piece of archive gives us fascinating insight into the training of the Stasi elite. Here, Marcus Wolf has invited none other than Kim Philby, the notorious British double agent who spied for the KGB. My advice to you is to tell all your agents that they're never to confess. If they're confronted with a photograph of themselves with a Soviet contact or a German contact, it's, it's a fake. But deny that essential link with any foreign intelligence service. I think there's a reason why Marcus Wolf wanted Kim Philby to talk to recruits and those rising through the ranks in foreign intelligence, to inspire them, to strengthen their spine, to give them a sense that they're part of something bigger. East Germany was a small country of around 16 million, tiny when compared to the might of the Soviet Union. Despite this, the Stasi's influence was felt across the world. They reached from Cuba, where they did a lot of training of the intelligence services, to Africa was clearly an area where they thought this is a place that the Cold War could be fought by proxy. You've got countries that are still developing. It's hard to find a part of the world they didn't target, particularly if it was useful to the Soviet Union and a place where the Soviets were maybe having difficulty operating. They filled that gap. They were a bit like a sort of intelligence travel agency. Yeah, you could go anywhere. Well, we know that the East German and Stasi were, actually, they were just satellite groups of the KGB. The KGB was very active in influence operations inside the United Kingdom. So when people went and reported into embassies, they were really reporting into the KGB. They were actively helping agents who were seeking not only to undermine the UK, but were brutal and murderous dictatorships at home. The Stasi and the Soviet KGB worked in collusion, the Stasi passing intelligence its network gathered to KGB agents based in East Germany. Every KGB agent that was stationed in Germany had their own Stasi ID card. Perhaps the most famous example of that is Vladimir Putin, who came over to East Germany and worked as a KGB agent, but also had his own Stasi ID. Vladimir Putin arrived in East Germany in the mid 80s. But then, on the 9th of November, 1989, the future president of Russia could only watch as the Berlin Wall fell and his world changed forever. Where men and women had once shed blood to try to reach the West, these East Germans filed into the pedestrian crossing point and across the East-West divide. In the north of the country, Siegfried photographed the crowds massing outside the Stasi's HQ in Rostock. Es wurden sogar Stasi-Leute unter die Demonstranten gemischt, die Demonstranten zu Gewalt anstiften wollten. Und dann vor dem Stasi-Gebäude die Leute, Stasi raus, Stasi raus. Nun war die Stasi innen drin und hatte Angst. In that moment where everything hangs in the balance, the Stasi just tries to destroy as much of its material as it can. And then it starts sending people to the shredders and people are literally sitting there with scissors where the shredders have been blocked and incinerators destroying the papers. Stasi! 
In the chaos, top secret documents identifying Stasi spies and informers overseas, known as the Rosenholz files, ended up in the hands of the CIA. After lengthy negotiations in the 90s, the US government gave its allies, including Britain, some of the files relating to their citizens. What makes the Rosenholz files so explosive was the idea that it potentially exposes the amount of spying that the Stasi had done in the West and the specific people that were involved in it. It wasn't until 1999 that it was revealed the Rosenholz files had been handed to the UK prompting calls for the Stasi spies and informers in Britain to be identified. The then Home Secretary, Jack Straw, confirmed that the files were being reviewed. Is the Home Secretary assuring this House that this material already has been examined, and if it has not been examined, when will it be examined? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, records have revealed many leads involving the investigation of over 100 individuals. When the government announced it was investigating more than 100 individuals, we finally realised the scale of Stasi activity here in Britain. But more than 20 years on, we've had precious little transparency about who was being investigated, and not a single person has been prosecuted. I don't believe that these names have been kept secret because it would be embarrassing if they came out. I think it's more a default setting that I've often found in British intelligence that if you've got something that's a big secret and you don't have to make it public, it might be more useful to know about it and not have it in the public domain. They've certainly never been very keen to engage on the subject of this information coming out. So who were the Brits who wanted to spy for the Stasi? And how had they been recruited? For nearly 30 years, the Berlin Wall split the city in two. I lived in West Germany as a student in 1987, when it still seemed inconceivable the wall would come down. Today, you can simply step through it, but just over 30 years ago, for any East German trying to get from East to West could have been a death sentence. It's thought around 400 were killed trying to cross the so-called death strip. Many thousands more were arrested for planning to, often imprisoned, often tortured. And all the time, watching, waiting, ready to pounce, were the Stasi. But while East Germans risked their lives to escape their country, British students were travelling there to study. My name is Graham Watson. I shared a dorm with a British Stasi informant. I had the opportunity to go and study for six months uh, in Leipzig. I jumped at the chance. We were warned of the danger of our being approached by uh, the Stasi. Uh, we went on those conditions. It was a different world. It was grey, colourless. It was very much a different world. Bleak. Bleak, absolutely. The student visits gave the Stasi the opportunity to seek to recruit idealistic British youngsters as spies. I was studying German at Oxford and I was always interested in the other Germany, the Germany we didn't hear so much about. I wanted to see it, feel it for myself. While studying in East Berlin, Anne was contacted by a man who claimed to work for a prestigious East German news agency looking to recruit her as an informant. And uh, he said, well, there are ways you can help this country. And he said, and in return for which, we would offer you a three-bedroom flat. <laughs> and it was just pretty plain to me at the time that it was recruitment. Anne wasn't tempted, and she turned down the offer. But certainly other students were sympathetic to East Germany's political cause. 
if you are inclined in this climate of the Cold War to go and study at the Karl Marx University <laughs> behind the Iron Curtain, the assumption was made that you're there because you're quite receptive to socialist and left-leaning ideas. The main purpose was to try and build a foreign intelligence network in Britain and elsewhere, uh, which would allow them to gather information long term. There were certainly people in Leipzig at the time and fellow students of mine who ended up in international organizations all over the place. I myself ended up in a career with the European Union institutions, but there were others who went to NATO, to the Western European Union and so on. And yes, these people would have been valuable to them. Ronch Darcy Handler has claimed that one in ten students visiting East Germany um, was recruited. Is that possible on that scale, do you think? My memory would tell me that there were probably about ten British students in Leipzig at the time that I was there. Um, and we now know that one of them was recruited. So, yes, rule of thumb. In this office in East Berlin and at 14 other cities across the country, the files of the Stasi are being made available for the first time. Despite the Stasi's efforts to destroy its records, nearly 70 miles of its files remained intact. 30 years ago, in 1992, Germany made the files public. Anyone could ask to see their file. Risking friendships and even marriages, 3,000 people applied to see their own personal records within the first 24 hours of opening. The impact of the opening of the files was quite traumatic. It held a mirror up to the East Germans to show them just how extensive this entire thing was. A lot of people had been a bit in denial about it and thought it was only affecting dissidents or, or, or troublemakers even, or uh, kind of punks as people called them, uh, when actually uh, it affected the whole of East German society. And this is where all those secrets and lies are kept, including the names of people who carried out countless betrayals on family, friends, loved ones, colleagues and comrades. There are millions of files here in the Stasi archive, including files on British informers. To be honest, it was rather flattering when I got the first tranche of my file. I think they were struggling with it. I think they really didn't know how to analyse someone who'd come for the kind of reasons I'd come, which were not ideological, they were curiosity. The Stasi called themselves the sword and the shield of the party. And if anything symbolises the sheer industrial scale of their power, and fanaticism, it's this place. Their Berlin HQ was part of a vast complex of buildings which cast a brutal shadow over Germany and beyond. The HQ is now a museum to ensure the horror of the Stasi is never forgotten. It's here that I'm meeting Felix Muller, the grandson of a former Stasi officer who's now a museum guide. So this is, when you think of a spy camera, you probably think of this. It's what's pictured in movies very often. This is James Bond territory. This chain, you can measure the distance to something. For example, a piece of paper that you want to take a picture of at your job, maybe, uh, in some government agency in West Germany or so. Could it have been used in the UK, a piece of equipment like this? Uh, it probably could have been. It's probably used by everybody. <laughs> the quintessential spy camera. The Stasi helped develop modern spycraft, the technology for surveillance and methods of manipulating information. This saying that East German intelligence had about being a great battle on the invisible front, as they called espionage, this battle for ideas, What's the truth? Who can you really believe? So that seems to me highly relevant if we look at the situation now of the Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin, the crisis in Ukraine. And what we believe or don't believe is going to drive the world we're in.
Back then, the Stasi's files were part of that battle. The surviving microfilm records give an insight into what information this secret police collected. Some of the most top secret, the so-called Rosenholz files, are kept in the Stasi's former HQ. This is it? Yeah. This is the canister for the Rosenholz. Yeah, these canisters were typically used to store microfilms. It's a real blast from the past, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this was a security copy that was supposed to go to the KGB, but the CIA was able to purchase this that from a KGB agent, and uh, this is how they survived. The Rosenholz files held records of Stasi spies in other countries, code names and their real identities. But while the US and Germany have prosecuted former Stasi spies, Britain hasn't. My name is Annie Mashon. I used to work as a British intelligence officer for MI5. The exposure of the Stasi files and the initiative in East Germany of conciliation um, was a great way forward. And it's good to hear that even the CIA, who usually keep their cards very close to their chest, still wanted that degree of transparency about American nationals who might potentially have spied for the Stasi. But in the UK, no. I mean, the policy is always no comment. But allowing people to sneak away or get away with it or brushing it under the carpet so it does not cause embarrassment, particularly if they are establishment figures, is a very British way of doing things. So what do we know about the Stasi's agents here in Britain? During the 1980s, with Cold War tensions high, the security services were working hard to break Stasi spy rings operating in Britain. In the autumn of 1984, Reinhardt and Sonja Schulze moved here to a rented house in Way Avenue, Cranford, right next to Heathrow Airport. Here in Britain, Stasi operatives were deep undercover, living among us in 1980s suburbia while all the time in contact with their spy masters back in East Berlin. My name is Simon Cranfield Thompson. I was a special branch detective in the 1980s. I was involved with an investigation into East German spies. The neighbours weren't really very interested in the kitchen designer and the translator. The intelligence community were saying, this is what we know, this is what we fear, this is what we suspect. Um, we really need uh, a, a, a proper investigation. You'd pass them in the street and you wouldn't give them a second glance. In August 1985, special branch officers arrested one such couple, Reinhardt and Sonja Schulze. They'd been under surveillance for weeks. It's under the main flight path to Heathrow, the house where police inquiries in London have been concentrating. The Schultzers lived here for several months until their arrest last Friday by the special branch. They were interrogated at the high security Paddington Green police station. Simon Cranfield Thompson was one of the investigating officers. I was escorting the husband. Uh, husband and wife were, were, were kept separate. I think it was sort of all very quiet, very orderly, very, very courteous. I, I must say, he wasn't, he wasn't bound in, in handcuffs and, you know, locked in the back of a van. Recently opened court files revealed how the investigation exposed the couple. I remind you again, you're under caution. Do you understand? Yes. Have you got any specific requests or complaints? I would like to know the charge. As I told you before, we are investigating offences under the Official Secrets Act committed by you and your wife. Well, they seem to be very comfortable and not overly upset that the fact is they've been arrested, separated, and going through lengthy interviews by the police officers. I will not answer any further questions concerning my name or concerning the objects under investigation. I demand that the Embassy of the German Democratic Republic in London be informed of my location immediately. My real name is Reinhard Schulze. A police search unit spent a month going over the house. They even dug the garden. Eventually they found what they were looking for false names, a false life. As it was revealed, there was all sorts of equipment that 
equip them as spies for communication purposes and for escaping in the event that they were, were caught somewhere, um, that they could, they could leave the country rapidly. Because of the inquiries we have made in this country and in other countries, we have strong reasons to suspect that you and your husband have been sent here by the authorities in East Germany to engage in acts of espionage. Do you deny that? Don't command. Hidden inside an air freshener in the garden shed, they found a one-time pad, an unbreakable code system which uses random groups of numbers to replace words. Inside the house was a tape cassette with a hidden recording in Morse and a sophisticated radio. Does your husband know you recorded this message? I need some time to think about it. While detectives waited, Sonja Schulze took nearly 15 minutes to think before giving an answer. Does your husband know you recorded this message? No, he doesn't. It was well rehearsed, it was a discipline, so they were sort of living their, their false lives with conviction. The Schulzes were agents of the foreign wing of the Stasi, and they answered to spy master Markus Wolf. I got a very interesting answer from Markus Wolf when I asked him explicitly about the Schulzes. He said that foreign intelligence started to invest in couples that they thought would work well together and would support each other, particularly people who were sleeper agents. They weren't attached to the embassies. They're living kind of free in the society which is hosting them, doesn't know they're spies. Reinhardt and Sonja Schulze were sentenced to 10 years each for breaking the Official Secrets Act. Nobody has revealed what information they were sending back to their spy masters. But the Stasi would go much further than simply spying in Britain. They were prepared to carry out murder. East Germany's secret police, the Stasi, used fear, brutality and surveillance to keep a tight grip on its people for more than 40 years. If anyone's read George Orwell's 1984, where children even are encouraged to snitch on their parents for thought crime, that's pretty much how the Stasi was allowed to operate within East Germany. The fact that your entire home could be wired for sound, put one tiny little bug somewhere or microphone outside the flat, was terrifying. The Stasi's single aim was to keep East Germany's communist regime in power, whatever the cost. Here I am Bernd Roth. Man can from me say Stasi-Täter, since frühester Jugend. Bernd Roth served the Stasi for over 20 years, achieving the rank of Major. Ich warne Sie nur vor einem. Wir machen, wir machen, ich mache keine Klischees mit Ihnen hier. Ich bin ja mit 16 Jahren da an sich das erste Mal in Kontakt gekommen und bin ja dann auch EM geworden. Es wurden aus meiner Klasse wurden zwei von der Schule delegiert in die US. Bin ich nun da reingerutscht und der Freund Und dann kam der, der Vorwurf, äh, der hat doch da Kontakt und Westgeld. Ja, habe ich ihn verraten. One in three East Germans were reported to the Stasi by its spies or informers. So when its files were opened to the public, East Germans had to confront their pasts. Das Thema habe ich natürlich viele, viele Jahre mit mir rumgeschleppt, bis ich ihn dann vor zehn Jahren, kann gewesen sein, mal bei einem ehemaligen Klassentreffen getroffen habe. Du hast doch bestimmt deine Akte gelesen und so, und da gab es eine Situation, wo ich dich in die Pfanne gehauen habe. Und da hat er zu mir gesagt, nee, nicht mit Pfanne gehauen. Meine Akte fängt aus 76 an. Es ist einfach, die wollten einfach nur wissen, packt er das aus? Ich? Bernds later successes included turning a West German agent into a double agent 
and exposing a CIA spy. Meanwhile, the Stasi's foreign intelligence wing got an important new boost to their work overseas. In 1973, East Germany was recognized by the UN and Britain as a legitimate state, and it opened an embassy in the UK. The Stasi's foreign espionage arm was hiding in plain sight, here at the former East German embassy in the heart of London. It was a nest of intelligence agents, all posing as diplomats, and their mission was clear, to infiltrate the Western elite and set up a network of informants in Cold War Britain. A couple of years earlier, 105 Russian agents had been kicked out of the UK and the Soviets had turned to the East Germans for help. So kind of what the KGB did is, is went, fine, we're, we're out of here, then that, that's OK, and kind of just sent the East German agents in. and Outsourced their work to the, <laughs> to the East German Foreign Intelligence Service. That's right. You almost ended up with like a work-sharing agreement between them. The Stasi seemed indestructible, and terrifyingly for those who stepped out of line, one of its tools was murder. Those people that left East Germany this was, and, and actually were active in the West, this was seen as, an, as, 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 as betrayal, and so there are cases where they try to kill people abroad. Wolfgang Welsch was one of them. He was held in some of East Germany's worst jails for nearly seven years until 1971, when an Amnesty International campaign in Britain led to him being freed and allowed to go to West Germany. Und was für ein Gefühl war das zu haben, hier zu stehen, hier zu leben und, und zu wissen, dass Menschen in England äh, ihnen helfen wollen. Ja. Jetzt Halt jemand die Hand über mir ja, und schützt mich. Und das war Amnesty. Das äh, werde ich nie vergessen. Den Menschen bin ich bis heute, bis an mein Lebensende sehr dankbar. Äh, sie haben mir Licht in meiner Dunkelheit gegeben. Wolfgang helped more than 200 people flee East Germany, becoming the communist state's enemy number one. Then, in 1980, the Stasi caught up with him outside London, here on the A2. He'd come to Britain to buy furniture with his friend Peter Hack. Und dann fuhren wir die Autobahn Richtung nach London. Und mein Freund Peter sagte er plötzlich, fahr jetzt mal langsam, die Polizei, die achtet hier auf Geschwindigkeit. Wolfgang slowed down and, by chance, reached to pick up his tobacco pipe. In dem Augenblick gibt's ein Schlag. Ich komme mit der Pfeife in der Hand hoch. Es ist ein Loch in der Windschutzscheibe und das Loch fasert schnell aus wie so ein Spinnennetz. A gunman targeting Wolfgang had shot at their van. Ich kann mir das kaum noch vorstellen. Und hätte ich mich nach einer Pfeife nicht gebückt, dann wäre ich heute tot. There has been a myth within the agency that the foreign intelligence are like the clean arm of the Stasi. They didn't shy away from pursuing people into West Germany, into other countries where people were basically followed by Stasi agents with the intent of uh, killing them, assassinating them. Wolfgang spent the night at Peter's flat in London. His friend dismissed the attack, blaming it on a stone thrown up by a car in front or someone taking a pot shot with an air rifle. Ja, jetzt sitze ich hier in der Besset Road und es ist ein merkwürdiges Gefühl hier. Wir sprachen ja nicht von Anschlag. Wolfgang only learned the truth years later when he read his Stasi file. His friend Peter Huck 
was part of a Stasi plot to assassinate him. Und wie war es, als sie herausgefunden äh, haben, dass der P Peter Hack nicht der Person, der gesagt hat? Das war für mich ein Schock. Und dass er kaltschnäuzig in dem Auto saß, mit dem wir nach London fuhren, neben mir. Und dass er wusste, dass ich jetzt erschossen werden soll. Das war mehr als nur Chutzpe. Das war also, ja, kaltblütiger Mörder sozusagen, der mich direkt zum Tatort fährt. Wolfgang says that Huck made two other attempts on his life. In 1994, Hack was sentenced in Germany to six and a half years for attempted murder. But behind the plans to kill Wolfgang was the Stasi's head of foreign intelligence, Markus Wolf. Markus Wolf hat also die Auslandseinsätze der Stasi gegen mich, das waren die Attentate, orchestriert. Und Markus Wolf hat gelogen. Sagt er, nein, also wir vom, vom äh, Intelligenzapparat, von der Spionage, wir hatten mit der Repression des übrigen Stasi-Apparates nichts zu tun. Ich wasche meine Hände in Unschuld, wir haben kein Blut an unseren Händen. A generation ago, people fleeing the oppression and violence of the communist East found safety in West Berlin. Vladimir Putin, who worked for the KGB and the Stasi, is said to have mourned the fall of the Berlin Wall, calling the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union a tragedy. Today, his invasion of Ukraine has triggered a new Cold War with NATO and the West. When the wall came down, thousands of people were freed from the most brutal torture that human societies had ever constructed. That's what the Stasi did. That's what the KGB did. Sadly, that's what the KGB is still doing under a new brand. Today, it's the Ukrainians fleeing the violence of Putin's Russia who are finding refuge in Berlin. The reality is that Putin has not only threatened almost all of his neighbors, but he's now invaded in the first state-on-state -state war since the Second World War. And this is an extraordinary act. Uh, and so I'm afraid uh, it doesn't feel very much like a Cold War right now. It feels pretty hot. This isn't just history at all. It's highly relevant now. If we look at it as a battle of ideologies, of worldviews, whose truth prevails, in whose interest, everything is contested. And that's why it's still such a powerful story today. The Stasi specialized in the control of truth and the dissemination of lies. Public transparency was their greatest fear. Germany's willingness to open the secrets of its Stasi past has helped us all understand better those terrible years of the Cold War. The uh, records have revealed many leads involving the investigation of over 100 individuals. Nearly 20 years since the names of the UK citizens who spied and informed for the Stasi were given to the government, they are still a secret. We asked the Home Office why, but were simply told the government wouldn't comment on intelligence matters. The politician and former student in East Germany, Graham Watson, discovered one of his fellow British students had spied on his group after reading his Stasi file. I was in Berlin to look at the official files which had by then been opened to the public. My first reaction was one of surprise. And you could see quite a lot of information about who we hung around with, who we had amorous affairs with, who we went drinking with, perhaps even sometimes what was discussed if he happened to be present. We tracked down the man Graham Watson believes was recruited in Leipzig in the 80s, but he declined to take part in this programme when approached. He denies ever being a Stasi informant, but his name and code name appear in the Stasi files. He has never been officially named or sanctioned. And yet, without the missing British piece of the Stasi jigsaw, it is a chapter of history that is still not yet quite complete. 
in Germany releasing the Stasi files 30 years ago sent shockwaves through the country, but it also helped rebuild a divided nation. It was very important for me that Stasi archive has been open and I have had the possibility to look who was my friend, very important, and who was not my friend. And for some, what happened in East Germany should be a warning to us and future generations. There's always this kind of desire of, of states and systems to control its people. It's often the thin end of a, of a wedge. The next thing is you control what they do. And the fact that this happened in a fairly advanced society after the Second World War, looking back onto the Gestapo and, and the crimes committed under the Nazis, and yet you end up with a system even more efficient than the previous one um, under, under the East German state. It is a slippery slope that bears lessons, I think, for today. Based on a true story of two British spies, one of whom may have been betrayed by the other, a spy among friends. Stream now on ITVX. Next year, the Gallagher Premiership. <laughs>